Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you could be with us today on Father's Day. My name is Olivia Mattis. I'm the president of the Souza Mendez Foundation. And it's my pleasure today to welcome you to our very special Father's Day program. So this month, the month of June 2020, we are marking 80 years since the Holocaust rescuer Aristides de Souza Mendez saved all those lives and paid such a heavy price being arrested and put on trial and losing everything that he had worked for in a 35 year diplomatic career. The Souza Mendes Foundation was founded 10 years ago to perpetuate his memory. And there were quite a few important things that happened this month to mark the anniversary. There were major stories in the New York Times and on the BBC website. And just a couple of days ago, the Pope, Pope Francis, marked the anniversary by declaring June 17th to be the day of conscience in memory of the action of Aristide de Souza Mendes, who followed his conscience, displayed moral courage, and did the right thing at the right time. So I'd like to welcome you inside the green suitcase. You all pressed on that little suitcase. So here you have just entered this very magical place. And so I'm wearing green to celebrate that fact. Before I introduce our two very special guests, we're going to be watching a film. And this film tells the story of André Lotte and her discovery of the suitcase and what came, what she found inside. So after we watch that film together, the film is about 15 minutes, then we will have a discussion. Uh, André, Dr. Lotte will be interviewed by Robert Jacobitz. They're both very dear friends of mine and I'll give them a fuller introduction after the film is done. So at this point, I guess we should start rolling the film. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Matthew Spurn. Dans cette histoire, il y a une vieille Peugeot, des poupées Barbie, Zanzibar, des montres suisses, un ballet breveté, un barrage célèbre, le peintre Dali, les nazis en France, une signature qui vaut de l'or, un mystérieux colonel corse, une famille de 15 enfants, un héros méconnu, 30 000 vies sauvées et une valise verte. Une valise verte qui va bouleverser la vie confortable d'André Lotté, professeur de littérature française à l'Université de Montréal, spécialiste de Jean Giono, mère de deux enfants dont un musicien, David. Je devais vendre la maison de, de maman qui était décédée quelques mois auparavant. Un jour, ma fille me dit « Maman, euh, quand tu iras chez mamie, est-ce que tu pourrais, s'il te plaît, regarder si tu ne trouverais pas de tes anciennes poupées Barbie ?» Je suis descendue au sous-sol. Il y avait une série de valises qui étaient empilées. C'était des grosses valises, vous savez, comme on voit dans les films. Là. Tout à coup, j'en ai trouvé une qui était une plus petite que les autres, une, une valise verte. Et quand j'ai pris les petites boucles argentées qui ont fait... J'ai été surprise par des centaines de papiers. Toutes portaient le nom de mon père. Pour moi, c'était un peu comme arriver dans la caverne d'Ali Baba, vous savez, et trouver un coffre au trésor. J'ai découvert un, un premier papier qui était du consulat de Pologne à Montréal, qui était daté de 1945. Et euh, il y avait écrit dessus, ceci est une attestation pour dire que M. Jacques Lotté tirait « Jacob Lottenberg est un citoyen honorable ». Jacob Lottenberg. André Lotté avait cinq ans quand son père est décédé. Sa mère, Cécile Lambert, ne lui en avait jamais beaucoup parlé. Ses souvenirs sont vagues, mais affectueux et surtout enveloppés de mystères. 
On m'avait toujours demandé depuis ma tendre enfance, mais d'où ça vient l'ôté? Euh, je, 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 ça vient d'où? Et ma mère disait toujours, c'est un nom polonais qui a été écourté parce que ton grand-père était dans les affaires à Paris. Mm. Euh, mais là, j'avais la vraie réponse. Alors, Lothenberg, ça ne faisait aucun doute avec un suffixe comme ça que c'était un nom juif. Dans cette valise, toute une vie, celle de Jacob Lothenberg, né en Pologne, fils de Diamantaire à Anvers, en Belgique, volontaire à 17 ans dans l'armée polonaise vers la fin de la Grande Guerre. Elle savait qu'à Montréal, son père importait les montres suisses et Nicar. Mais elle apprend aussi qu'il avait été copropriétaire d'une charcuterie hébraïque, aujourd'hui disparue, juste à côté de chez Schwartz, rue Saint-Laurent à Montréal. Puis, avec les documents dans la valise, elle remonte le temps. J'ai trouvé qu'en 1937, mon père avait un commerce à Paris et qui était rue de Wagram. C'est une boutique d'accessoires que tenait son père. Les nouveautés, lotées. Il a même breveté une invention, un balai inusable. J'ai découvert aussi que mon père avait été marié et qu'il avait eu une petite fille, Jacqueline, en 1937. Cette demi-sœur aujourd'hui décédée, André ne l'a jamais connue. Elle se lance dans une vaste enquête, ici et en Europe, où elle établit de nombreux contacts. Hi Allô, Jackie Allô, allô, allô Ça va Tout va bien, et toi Ça va très bien. Jackie lui fournit une mine de renseignements. C'est une passionnée d'histoire établie en Belgique. Elle aide à comprendre une foule de choses sur la famille d'André. La guerre éclate en 1939. La Pologne est envahie par les nazis. Dans la valise verte, André a trouvé des cartes postales écrites en allemand à son père en provenance de Pologne. Ce qui m'a glacé, mais vraiment horrifié, c'est que en, en regardant de plus près, j'ai vu là ici euh, le sceau de, de la Gestapo. Ces cartes venaient de ma tante Anna, qui était la sœur de mon père, et euh, donc j'ai compris qu'elle avait été euh, emprisonnée au ghetto, euh, dans le ghetto de Lodge. Les lettres sont censurées par l'armée allemande, mais on devine la détresse des prisonniers du ghetto de Lodge. Nous remercions Dieu, nous sommes en santé, mais nous avons l'air terrible. Nous te prions de nous envoyer du poisson, de l'huile d'olive ou d'autres matières grasses et un peu de café. Et j'ai découvert qu'elle avait été une des rares survivantes, je crois qu'ils étaient environ 800 seulement. Elle a été, en 1944, elle a été ensuite euh, euh, déportée à, à Auschwitz, après ça à Flossenberg et après ça à Theresienstadt, où elle a été libérée par l'armée russe. Mai 1940, les Allemands envahissent la France et ils persécutent les Juifs. La femme de la résistance française doit pas s'éteindre. Le 18 juin, le général de Gaulle est à Londres. Il lance aux Français son fameux appel à la résistance. 6 millions de Français fuient l'avance nazie vers le sud. C'est l'exode. L'énigme pour moi a toujours été, si mon père s'appelait Lothenberg et qu'il habitait Paris en 1937 avec sa femme et sa fille, comment a-t-il bien pu s'échapper Il doit s'enfuir de Paris. Ce bout de papier tout rafistolé était le bien le plus précieux de Jacob Lothenberg, devenu Jacques Lothenberg. Et il raconte une véritable odyssée. C'est un papier daté du 18 juin 1940 et qui dit que M. Jacques Lothenberg, chauffeur du colonel aviateur Giovannoli, titulaire du passeport Dadada, et se rend à Paris et à Biarritz et retour en voiture Peugeot immatriculé 4609 RM3. Le rapport de Jacques Lothenberg avec le colonel Giovannoli, un militaire français d'origine corse décoré de la Légion d'honneur, reste nébuleux. S'était-il rencontré dans l'armée 20 ans plus tôt et que faisait un commerçant parisien, chauffeur d'un militaire C'est une grande énigme pour moi encore. Est-ce qu'ils étaient ensemble Est-ce qu'ils n'étaient pas ensemble dans la Peugeot Je ne sais pas. Jacques Lothenberg est parmi les derniers à franchir la frontière espagnole près d'Andaï le 25 juin 1940, au volant de la Peugeot, avec son précieux sauf-conduit. Enfin libre, il traverse l'Espagne et se réfugie au Portugal. Sa femme Bessita et sa fille Jacqueline parviennent à s'embarquer pour le Brésil. Lui est refusé. Il restera un an et demi au Portugal. On peut juste imaginer le drame d'un père, d'une famille comme ça séparée. Ça a dû être épouvantable. Dans le coin du fameux document, un visa pour le Portugal. André parvient à identifier l'auteur de la signature. Une signature qui vaut de l'or. Quand j'ai tapé toutes ces dates, tout m'a dirigé vers Aristide de Sousa Mendes 
qui était le consul du Portugal à Bordeaux en 1939. André découvre ainsi l'existence d'un personnage plus grand que nature dont l'histoire va la bouleverser. C'est un choc pour moi, c'est un peu comme se retrouver sur la liste de Schindler. Ses recherches ont conduit André sur les traces de la grande famille d'Aristide de Sousa Mendes. Jusque chez Ruth, 88 ans, la veuve de l'un des fils du consul, Louis Felipe, et deux de leurs trois enfants, Louis-Philippe et Linda. Ils vivent à Montréal. Il était stationné à Bordeaux et a commencé ici à, à donner des visas. Ensemble, ils revivent la grande saga du consul de Bordeaux. Aristide et son jumeau César grandissent dans une famille aristocratique du Portugal. Leur père est un juge respecté. Les deux frères feront une belle carrière dans la diplomatie. Son épouse Angelina à ses côtés, Aristide est nommé consul en Guyane britannique, à Zanzibar, au Brésil, à Anvers, en Belgique. En 1938, le président Antonio Salazar le nomme à Bordeaux. Il s'y installe avec ses 14 enfants. Lorsque la guerre éclate, César est ambassadeur du Portugal à Varsovie. Il sait tout des persécutions des nazis en Pologne, en particulier des Juifs, et il en informe son frère. Les réfugiés affluent à la frontière espagnole. Le consul leur émet des visas portugais qui leur permettront de traverser l'Espagne. Quand ces gens-là arrivaient au Portugal, euh, ils ne correspondaient pas à ce que l'autorité exigeait. C'est par la suite que Salazar a émis la circulaire 14, qui interdisait absolument qu'il qu donne des visas. Le doute l'assaille. Doit-il obéir, comme tout le monde Sa rencontre avec le rabbin Chaim Kruger lui ouvre les yeux. Le film « Désobéir » relate cet épisode. « Nous ne partons pas. Vous ne voulez plus quitter la France ?» Pas tout seul, mon cher consul. Je ne peux pas partir tout seul en laissant les miens ici. Le rabbin refuse son visa s'il ne peut amener tous les réfugiés qui sont avec lui. Après trois jours de réclusion totale, Aristide en ressort les cheveux tout blanchis. Et je fais le serment de délivrer des visas à tous ceux qui me le demanderont. Des milliers de visas émis vers le Portugal et la liberté, émis jour et nuit en désobéissance totale des ordres du dictateur Salazar, sympathisant des nazis. Il avait son devoir envers l'autorité, mais il a changé l'autorité, la figure d'autorité. Il a changé Salazar pour, pour, sa, pour sa foi en Dieu. Aristide de Souza Mendes aura donné la liberté à des milliers de gens ordinaires, mais aussi à plusieurs membres de la famille Rothschild, au peintre Salvador Dali, à l'archiduc héritier d'Autriche, Otto de Habsbourg et sa famille, à la duchesse de Luxembourg et à sa famille. Les envoyés de Salazar sont aux trousses du consul qui continue à désobéir. Allons-y Il prend la tête personnellement d'un dernier petit groupe jusqu'à la frontière. Les Espagnols ferment la porte aux réfugiés porteurs d'un visa interdit, celui de Sousa Mendes. Ils passeront par un petit poste qui n'avait pas le téléphone et ignorait la consigne. On croit que Jacques Lautenberg et sa famille étaient du nombre. Avec sa fameuse liste, Oscar Schindler a sauvé plus d'un millier de Juifs. Mais en neuf jours seulement, de Sousa Mendes a sauvé environ 30 000 personnes, dont un tiers de Juifs. Moi, c'est ce que j'admire le plus, c'est le courage euh, qui, dont il a fait part avec son, son épouse euh, Angelina. Au-delà de tout, euh, ils ont décidé de prendre le risque d'être droit, d'être honnête. Il paiera le prix fort pour sa désobéissance. Rappelé à Lisbonne, le consul sera jugé et rayé de la carrière diplomatique, privé des trois quarts de ses revenus. Pour que ses enfants échappent à leur situation de paria dans leur propre pays, il les enverra tous à l'étranger. Il mourra dans un grand dénuement en 1954, six ans après sa femme Angelina. Mon père est resté le dernier avec son père, puis mon père aimait beaucoup apprendre. Et puis il ne pouvait plus aller à l'école. Il n'avait plus les moyens d'aller à l'école, ils étaient rejetés de toute façon. Donc c'est son père qui lui a enseigné les mathématiques, l'histoire, la géographie. Aristide cherche à faire instruire Louis Felipe, son plus jeune fils, hors du Portugal. Une invitation providentielle arrive de Québec. Quand il était consul en Belgique, Aristide ouvrait sa maison tous les dimanches aux étudiants étrangers. Parmi ceux-ci, un jeune prêtre prénommé Alphonse Marie, le futur Monseigneur Parent, recteur de l'Université Laval. C'est lui qui accueillera en 1948 Louis Felipe, qui deviendra ingénieur. 
Au Québec, Louise Philippe n'a qu'une envie, tout oublier. Il épouse Ruth Tremblay et fonde une famille. C'est drôle, il avait peur de se faire déporter. Et une nuit, il a fait un cauchemar, il a rêvé que les gens de la gendarmerie venaient, venaient le chercher pour le ramener, pour le ramener pour le ah. tellement il avait peur. Il y avait une douleur très profonde qu'il avait dans son cœur. Son remède, sa façon de faire, c'était euh, de se fonder une famille puis ensuite de travailler, d'être de, 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 passionné pour son travail. Et puis quand il arrêtait de travailler, il y a une tristesse qui faisait surface. Louis Felipe participe à la construction du barrage Daniel Johnson à la Manique. Il sent qu'il prend racine là où on veut lui. Il a bien réussi, il est devenu un expert international en barrage. Mais comme tous ses frères et sœurs, il lui restait un devoir à accomplir, le devoir de mémoire. Une fois que cette histoire serait connue et reconnue, elle n'appartiendrait plus à la famille. Puis ce serait la libération pour la famille, puis elle appartiendrait à l'humanité. Des fondations de Susan Mendes ont été créées. C'est avec des gens comme André que la famille Sousa Mendes, dispersée à travers le monde, a pu reconstituer la saga du consul de Bordeaux et réhabiliter la mémoire d'un héros oublié de l'humanité. Des hommages ont été rendus à travers le monde. Il a été inscrit sur la liste des justes parmi les nations au mémorial de l'Holocauste de Yad Vashem à Jérusalem. Son nom figure sur des plaques commémoratives dans de nombreux pays. Ce parc de Montréal lui a été dédié. L'État portugais s'est officiellement excusé auprès de la famille et a restitué, 30 ans après sa mort, tous les titres et les droits qu'il avait retirés à Aristide de Sousa Mendes. On veut maintenant restaurer le vieux manoir familial au Portugal et en faire un musée. Faire en sorte qu'un jour euh, la justice soit faite et que leur nom soit, soit reconnu comme, euh, comme étant euh, celui d'une personne qui a fait la bonne chose au bon moment. Quelques jours avant de mourir, mon grand-père a dit à un de ses neveux, « Dieu, j'ai rien à vous laisser, mais que mon nom, mais il est propre. » C'est un très bel exemple pour tous les chefs qui, euh, qui ont des fois à désobéir pour, pour ne pas aller contre leur conscience. Seulement 3 000 personnes sur les 30 000 qui ont été sauvées par Sousa Mendes sont connues. Beaucoup de familles ignorent encore toute cette histoire, ou bien elles ont décidé, comme la mère d'André, de taire leurs secrets. Quand mon père est décédé et que je n'avais que 5 ans, elle a estimé qu'il y avait déjà probablement assez de drames comme ça dans ma vie. Alors elle a laissé la, le, le soin au destin de décider quand je trouverais la vérité. Wonderful. So now you've heard the full story, or at least you've had a taste of the story. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our two special guests for today. So Dr. André Lotte is a professor of, of um, French literature at the, at the University of Montreal. She's a former board member of the Sousa Mendes Foundation. She now serves on the advisory council. And so before we hear from you, André, just say a little hi and a little wave so people see you. Hello, everyone. We're very happy to see you today and happy Father's Day. Thank you for being with us. And our other special guest is Mr. Robert Jakovitz, who's been involved in the Susan Mendez cause for about 35 years. And he knows full well what the family of the hero Susan Mendez went through from the time when the hero Susan Mendez was unrecognized and officially in, in uh, well, officially punished by the state of Portugal to now when he's a national hero and what that trajectory has done uh, to give a sense of relief to the family. So Robert uh, was observing that at close range and he today is chair of the foundation's advisory council. So Robert, just say a quick little hello and before I launch it to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. So I wanted to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, so they're going to have a conversation. It's now 4.20. So they're going to speak for about, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions. So just sit back and listen. And at a certain point, uh, you can start typing your questions into the chat window, and we'll get to those at the end of the program. 
The other thing I wanted to say is that today's program is one of a whole series of events we have been presenting. Every Sunday, we've been holding one of these virtual events with the idea being that people are stuck at home and they're looking for beautiful, optimistic stories. And so we're trying to fill that need. We've been uh, doing these programs uh, since March and they're scheduled every Sunday into the middle of August currently and longer if there's still a demand for them. So I do urge you to sign up for our upcoming events. In particular, uh, next week is going to be a very, very special event, which will be a uh, half film screening and then the other half will be a live musical performance and it's about the very tender and beautiful story of Alice Hertz Summer who was the world's oldest Holocaust survivor. She died at age 110. The film was made when she was 109. It won the Oscar for best short documentary in 2014 and it's going to be well worth your time as she has a lot of very important things to say then there'll be this uh, musical response to the film that i think is going to be something very special so now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to my good friend robert jacobitz robert thank you olivia and again welcome everyone um just my addition to um, olivia's introduction of dr uh, lote is, is that she received her PhD and master's in, uh, in creative literature and in French from the University of Montreal. And she teaches there as well at the University of Montreal and Concordia University. And she's got a distinguished, has a distinguished record in some of her creativity. And one of them being is that she has just put together a, um, a screenplay on Marc Chagall. And I hear that congratulations are in order. Tell us what happened with your screenplay. Andre. Oh, Robert, thank you. You're very generous, but it's been a, a long, long adventure, as you know how it is to uh, write a screenplay when you have an idea. And, and it seems that we're going forward uh, around uh, this story that involves Marc Chagall with a new producer. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. And also people should know that in addition to what you experienced with the Green Suitcase, she also is putting together a screenplay and a novel. So we wish you luck with that also, Andre. Thank and, you. Uh, Lots you know, of early mornings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one of the things that, you know, and Andre and I had a discussion in preparation for, for, today's, um, for today's discussion as well. One of the things I observed is that Andre had a, you no, know, she was an only child um, with a widowed mother living in a very warm and nurturing um, household. Yes. And they were, again, part of the Canadian French Catholic community in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And by extension, her mother's family, the Lamberts. And so uh, it was really a great foundation for Andre. And um, one of the things I really found to be of unique uh, quality is, is that um, her mother was a translator. How many languages did your mother speak? My mom spoke two languages. She was really fluent in French and English. Good. And uh, so she, because she was a translator, um, she really focused on these two languages uh, that, that and it required so much, uh, so much of her attention. But she was interested by Latin languages like Spanish and Italian, but she didn't speak them. Right, but the point that I'm making is, is that in understanding her father's um, Jacques or Jacob, as we'll mm -hmm. understand who he was and who he became. Right. He, I think he spoke, what, six or seven languages? I tried to count them in preparation for today. But again, yeah. and you, you're, you know, again, you teach language and your expertise in being a linguist. So again, he, he what, he spoke his native Polish. He yes. must have spoken Yiddish. He would have yeah. known Hebrew. Mm -hmm. He knew France, French. He had to know English. And I think I'm missing one other language that he may have known. Oh, German. German. Because his sister wrote to him in German as well. Correct. Correct. Right? That's right. So, so, so it was a wonderful quality and inheritance that you have from both your father and your mother. And that served you very well. And I think his being a linguist or a, um, had helped save his life sometime during his escape from the Nazis. And maybe we'll, um, we'll talk about that later. For but sure. I know that just, I just wanted to have a question. Um, your father passed away when you were five. 
Yes, my and father. Then I'd away. like to, from the years when your father passed away, to when your mother passed away, mm -hmm. and when your your daughter said to you, "Mommy, see if you could find the Barbie dolls that yes. you once had in your mother." How many years was that from when your only, father died and your mother passed away? That was only a few months. So my mom passed okay. away in August, and and a few months, about seven months after was that specific day when my daughter uh, asked me to go check if we could find the old uh, Barbie dolls before I would sell her house. So that was totally uh, unexpected as a discovery when you're looking for Barbies and instead you're looking, you find all the answers that you had been hoping for all your life. I think it was a good, a, a good mom's executive decision on my part to go and uh, follow her dream. <laughs> Right, because what I understand from you is, well, your mother was very nurturing. She, very, she didn't tell you very much about your father's background. And she, so there was just this vacuum in understanding who, more about your father? Correct. So you see, my mom was very nurturing and she was very, very open. And all my friends would confide in her. I would confide in her. She was like a really, like an open book for the others, ready to receive the other people's stories. However, on her case, she was more quiet, you know? And when, when I was a little girl, when my father died and I was five years old, um, I quickly learned that whenever I would bring him up, I would ask questions, it would make her cry, it would make her sad. So even at five, you can kind of become a parent. And I knew that that, that was going in a sensitive zone. So I refrained myself from asking questions. And like that, we had this kind of silence that, that was there. And I let her volunteer her stories that would always revolve about le grand amour of her life and all that. But I, but I knew deep down, Robert, that one day, um, not at the risk of shattering, of, of, of making her very upset, but I knew that one day I would want to find out more about him. Th that was in my head very clear. Yeah, I didn't. But that, that, that silence was very heavy, wasn't it? I mean, that was the, the pondering, knowing what your roots were and where your father you know, fit into your, into your life. Oh, and I remember oh, you recounting me. Go ahead. No, you're, you're right, because I think there's something very, I realized that there's something very fundamental, very uh, visceral that we have this urge to find out about our roots. It's not for nothing that we see adoptive children who are at one point tempted to find their biological parents. It's something that's very embedded. And I didn't realize it that much. People would ask me questions about my father, and I always had my little repertoire of answers, but... That was that. I and again, one of the things we talked about is that when you finally went into the basement yeah. and you saw the stack of luggage of, again, on one side and then the little green valise, the valise yes. bin at, yes. the, at the other side. Yes. This and one? And you opened it. That, oh, oh wonderful. <laughs> 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 so that was the, you said it was like Alibaba's cave what brought you into a, tre a treasure chest. Exactly, because that day it was a cold day and I still had my coat in on and I had to go downstairs to look for my daughter. And it was incredible because when I opened it and all the papers were there, it was such a joy for me to, to, to find out more in one minute, in one day that, than in a whole lifetime. And it right. was very curious because um, that day my daughter was going to see a play about uh, Anna Brady, who's a little girl who died during the Holocaust, and it was Hannah's suitcase. And so when I picked her up and she asked me, did you find my Barbies? I told her, today you saw Anna's suitcase, but now there's Andre's suitcase. So there it was, all the answers. But what it prompted me to do, and I, and I suspect that a lot of people um, that are with us today would do the same, is that if you had something like that appear in your life, you would absolutely jump and, and start a research and become a detective and take every single little indication and lead to take it from one story to another and to try to reconstruct that puzzle. And, and I think that for anyone who has that curiosity, it's, it's a phenomenal adventure because it leads you 
to see how many tools are out there, luckily, to help us do these, these uh, solve some equations. One of the first things, sorry, yes? Go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I was about to say that, that um, there's unlimited resources today to help us uh, access this, even from the moment where I discovered the suitcase in 2007 to, to now, 13 years later, there are many things that become available uh, from one month to the next. And uh, it's, it links you to a whole community of searchers, of researchers who have unveiled history and unveiled heroes like Sousa Mendes, for instance. You know, that was my biggest discovery ever. Yeah, you know, you were really in search of your roots. You had one part of your roots, but there was again that vacuum. I remember you telling me that uh, you think you, you su surprised that your mother left the valise there for you as part of fulfilling your destiny, which I found to be very a wonderful, just a wonderful feeling that that was your mother's present, whether she could not articulate what had happened to you but it was for you to find, I guess, and for you to, to fulfill your destiny, to find out your other half of, of your life. Correct. And, and I think that um, a few people have asked me, why do you think that your mother has kept that a secret? And I think that to talk about the past was very painful for her. And, and, and let's not forget, she was from a very strict Catholic upbringing, the youngest of 11 children. And I think she thought, oh, I'll tell her one day when, when the appropriate, when she can handle it. And then maybe tomorrow, maybe, maybe tomorrow. Now she's too young. Oh, now she has an exam. Now it's never the right time. And the more you wait, the, the heavier the secret becomes. And she wanted to protect me a bit like Roberto Benigni in Life is Beautiful, you know, in that wonderful movie. You, she had that sense of uh, protecting me. And, and so the suitcase was there for me to find that. There's no doubt about that. You know, and part of, again, your mother being, again, part of a very large Catholic family. And mm -hmm. that you're discovering that your father was Jewish. Yeah. He I was, was so Jacob Lotenberg before he was Jacques Lotte. That's right. And what that significance must have meant to you and how it affected your mother's relationship with her family. And of course with you, but it appeared that they were a loving family. They were protective of her. Yes. And yes. that contributed to the good person you are now and, and the happy person you are now and creative, which is a wonderful attribute to your family in raising you. Thank, and thank I just you. wondered, if was there a chance, was there ever any anti-Semitism that you had experienced or some disparaging comments about Jews that was a mark against something that was part of your life and growing up? Well, you know, that's very interesting because my father died was on, when I was five and, and I had no idea that I had a, a link to, to Jude, Judaism, that I would be half Jewish. However, I do think that if I did another PhD, it would probably be on genetic memory because I was always fascinated and attracted by Jewish. My husband is Jewish. My best friends were Jewish. I always, my script on Chagall, I loved his paintings representing the shtetl and I just had this total, total attraction. And, and so I do remember my mother hearing comments one day from people she knew and, and she told me after how that she had told them, how dare you speak like that and, you know, about Jews and, and uh, my grandchildren are Jewish and, and, um, my, my, and I married a Jewish man, which is uh, the biggest proof of all that I had this affinity and this attraction to, uh, my husband is Michael Goodman. I mean, how, you know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, all this, uh, this beshert little, you know, <laughs> <laughs> travel that uh, itinerary that uh, my life uh, ended up having and your daughter's Leia and your son is David correct and and there's a little anecdote um, that that I'll try to, to, to make summarize when when I was talking about wonderful tools that are at our, our uh, for a searcher if you do research I discovered through through uh, my mother-in-law um, uh, a JRI Poland which is Jewish Record Indexing Database. 
So, which, so Stanley Diamond, who's here with us today, has created this unbelievable genealogy database, which helps researchers all over the world to retrace their roots. So I speak with Stanley and I tell him, I know my father lived in Belgium. He puts me in touch with someone from Belgium who's a detective and who tells me, you know, Andre, I found out the name of your great grandmother. Would you like to know what it is? And I said, of course. And she told me, you won't believe this. Her, she said, uh, ah, her, her name was Lea, Lea ah. Klotzmann. And I am the one who chose that name for our daughter. I was Lea, L-E with an accent, A. And you know, you, you, you wonder all these signs that, that go from scientific research to, to meeting your personal uh, intimate story. The intimate story to story with a, a big H, like finding Susan Mendes, you know, my little suitcase leading me to the biggest hero of, uh, of the Holocaust. That's what's, where life wonders. And you know, another part, another antidote, no, no, another real story is, is that you find out you had a half sister. Your father uh had another family. Tell us about that. Yes, so in the revelations, the first revelation was that my father was Jewish. The second one was that I found papers in which he described that there is a, an attestation saying to my daughter, Jacqueline Carmen Sophie Lothenberg. And I was like, I'm the daughter. How is this possible? So um, I discovered that he had been married um, in the 30s to uh, Besita, Besita Fari, who was from Bulgaria. And, and uh, Jacqueline was born in 37 in November in Paris. And so when my father on these uh, very important days of June, 80 years ago, decided to escape with his wife and daughter, it was as a great father to save her, I'm sure, and to decide that if they stayed in Paris, they would be doomed. So, um, of course, I was very excited to find out what would happen to my, my half-sister, Jacqueline. Um, I had always wanted to have siblings, so um, I hired, I had to at one point hire a private detective, and uh, we discovered that she left Montreal, moved to New York, married a jazz musician who played a jazz drummer who played with Count Basie, Dizzy Gillespie, and famous uh, jazz musicians, and um, finally, uh, thanks to the detective, I found one of his sons who was a famous chef in Maui. And um, he told me that he didn't know much about uh, Jacqueline. Unfortunately, it was his father's first wife. And I discovered that Jacqueline died in uh, the 80s in um, San Francisco. So I'm not sure um, that's all I have, and that's one of the big uh, enigmas I still have to resolve uh, in my research. But, but, it's never done, at, never at over. At least you know about it. I mean, at least it's again, right. it's all that right. serendipitous of what happens that brings your, your life fuller. Now, sure. there was something else that I wanted to, to discuss is because it was part of your father being able to escape to freedom. Sure. Um, there is this visa he has that was issued by the ambassador of Poland in France for your right. father, who was now not Jacob, but Jacques Lautenberg, he was the supposedly chauffeur for a car, for a for a colonel, Corsican colonel. Yes. And how did that come about? And how do you think that happened? Or what was it? Again, he was transitioning his identity, language, and I think it was sheer luck. Go ahead. I think so I think he was quite crafty and quite astute at at, at finding ways to leave. So I discovered in the papers that he had fought at the age of 17 in World War I. And I couldn't figure out what was the link between Giovanoli, the colonel aviateur, and him. So I did research and I discovered that that colonel Giovanni, Giovanoli had fought in Poland in World War I. So is it possible that they had met there? I guess that's my, my biggest theory. And after the presentation of this documentary film, um, this wonderful man from Corsica contacted me, who's a, he is himself a, a lawyer, genealogist. He put me in touch with the Giovanoli family, and now we're friends. So another great gift. 
and they ex we haven't found specifically what the link was but i think that they wrote um this this uh this paper to allow my father to leave but i think the colonel was never in my father's car he was in the peugeot with his wife and daughter but that gave him uh That's right you know, it was a ruse to get him to freedom correct because you because in the papers um we saw that your father's sister wrote him the postcards from the ghetto yes and essentially they were you know they were moved to the concentration camps so he saw the writing on the wall yes and, you know and when i've interviewed other visa recipients i have found out through a stroke of luck and luck and genius yes. they have been able to find ways um to escape certain death right and it's really an amazing kind of an experience and again you're here and your family's here yes. because of what your father did and again the circumstances of Sosa Mendes giving him the transit visa for sure and and unfortunately i do remember my mother saying that uh i do remember that my mother said my father had told hanka his sister do not go back to poland don't go back it's too dangerous and i remember my mother said she didn't listen but she didn't go into details so when i saw the postcards addressed to my father in portugal it was amazing and a, a gold mine of information because i had his addresses in lisbon and his address in figueira da foz so they those four postcards told the story of despair of my aunt who was married to a dentist who didn't survive and then i did a lot of research on her she, i know she was a survivor because she came to montreal but when she was one of the rare survivors of the lodge ghetto she was then deported to um auschwitz birkenau to flossenberg and to uh to Lisbon, yeah. where she was liberated by the russian army yeah. so um what people have endured is not even possible it's amazing it's amazing and you continue yes. you continue to thrive Oh. and bring us more. So um, questions are starting to come into the chat yeah. window. I'd like to encourage people to continue asking the questions. Right now, I would like to mark this anniversary. I do notice that we have another daughter of a survivor, Cookie Fisher, who, notice, who notes that today is the anniversary of her mother receiving the visa 80 years ago on June 21st, 1940. And in fact, Andre, isn't it also for you? Exactly. The 80th to the day, June 21st. It's Your incredible. father on this day 80 years ago received that visa. Yes. It's right. incredible. So perhaps your family and Cookie's family. Uh, yes, I, I, let's let Cookie let's speak after this. We have, you know, maybe that will be uh we'll discover that they knew each other, we'll discover something uh incredible. Who knows? Well, I think someday we'll have a reunion of children of visa recipients, so you all can meet each other someday when we're finally out of lockup. So that's something to aspire to. Well, we do yes. sponsor these trips. Right. The Susan Mendes Foundation does organize trips for descendants of visa recipients, as well as others. The trip is open to the general public. The trip is called Journey on the Road to Freedom, and it travels through France, Spain, and Portugal. It's a 10-day trip going from Bordeaux, France, to Lisbon, Portugal. We've done four of these trips. We were supposed to do our fifth one this summer. Of course, we had to cancel it with COVID. But as soon as it becomes possible to hold these trips again, we will be doing so. So if people are interested, please, please let us know of your interest and we'll send you more information. So somebody in the chat window, Andre, is asking if you ever found the Barbie dolls. <laughs> That's a very good question. I found Barbie dolls. I did, uh, but uh, they, they came uh, enriched. How's that? <laughs> I, I didn't find the exact ones that you wanted, but I did find a few <laughs> for sure. It's a good, good question. Another question is, are you upset that your mother never told you and left it up to chance? Ah, uh, good question. No, it's very interesting. Um, I think my son, David, summarized it very well. He said, 
Had you known about this, that wouldn't have been a story. That it would just just been papers in a suitcase. That would have been that. But when I found it, it gave me a whole purpose, a whole adventure, and it really was cathartic because it helped me get over. You know, I was very attached to my mother, so it it really helped me, you know, do the 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 you know the day you know the passage from from one parent to another. And I felt like now I had some time to give to my father. That's how I, I took it. So I was never angry and I understood her. It was a different era. And I knew that it was probably unbearable, an unbearable secret to, to keep. But I think in life, very often things happen for a good reason. So no, I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't angry. Now I see that Stanley Diamond has asked a question. You mentioned him a minute ago. Yes. He asks, André, was the suitcase there all along to be found while you were growing up? I don't know because, you know, I was quite a bit of a snoop. I would say that when my mother wasn't there, sometimes I would go in the basement and I would look for things and I would look in my father's closets and things like that. But I never paid attention to that suitcase ever, ever. So did she plant it there at some point? because she was very orderly. There was nothing, it was very organized. So I don't know uh, exactly if, if uh, I had misread the suitcases, but I just know it happened at the right moment. Thank you, Stanley. <laughs> now I'm curious to know what puzzles you've been able to resolve from the suitcase and what puzzles remain? Good question. So the puzzles, for me, the biggest one was with a name like Lottenberg, how was he able to escape Paris? And for me, the most beautiful discovery was to discover that, that there was a foundation in, in Bordeaux. And I, when I called uh, Manuel Diaz in Bordeaux, he immediately sent me to you. And then what the coincidence to discover that, um, that Susa Mendes had family in Montreal. I mean, how unbelievable is that? How lucky am I? And I was able to be, we're friends, you know, it's, it's quite, quite a gift. And Ruth Mendez said, you are now part of our family. I mean, how, what a gift that is. And I was able to discover, uh, you know, what happened to my aunt. I was able to discover, I was able to discover more of my father's life and destiny. What I still would love to know is in, when we did research in, in Antwerp, I discovered my father had another sister. Her name was Felicity. Felici, and it took Stanley finally helped me find that her name was Kuzinski. She had a daughter, Alina, but I have no trace of her. And I would like to find out what happened to her in case I would have cousins or someone that would remain in the family. And I would like, and now I was hoping to go to Portugal this year, and I want to go to, to Poland to do more research, but I was hoping to go to Portugal, namely because there is in Figuera da Forge a lady who might be, who I think is with us today, Dame Suzette, whose father was a famous, um, he was a very well-known hero uh, in Portugal who risked his life to help the refugees who were flooding Figuera da Forge. And she was eight years old at the time, and she remembers a Polish man who was about 40, who was very, very sad because his wife and daughter had left for Brazil. And um, this young professor, Maria, uh, who is here with us today as well, organized a Skype with her little students. And we met um, Suzette. I met her through Zoom and we did a whole story on the green suitcase. So I would like, there are people that I would like to go meet, find out more about life in Portugal, discover archives in Portugal that are probably still to open up as, as we saw when we did the trip in 2013 together, um, we, we know that there's a lot of uh, data to be restored yet, to, that has yet to be restored. So that's it. And to find out more about Jacqueline. So we have 10 more minutes and I'll wait for people to add more questions to the chat window. In the meantime, uh, Robert, why don't you resume your interview? Good, um, thank you. I was just curious, you know, both your son and your daughter, they mm -hmm. must have an opinion in finding out their roots. 
And is that something you'd be able to share with us as well? Yes, I think they were very, um, I think, well, given the fact that their, their family is uh, Jewish, that the remain, I don't have any brothers or sisters, but my husband has three sisters and the cousin. So I think the fact that suddenly they, they, they were Jewish as well, it, uh, it made them very, you know, very happy and very proud because we celebrated both. So that was nice. And I remember my daughter saying, oh, good, now I'm three quarters. <laughs> <laughs> so she was good in math. So, so for, I think for, for us, um, for me, it explained many things about my, about my propensity to always go uh, towards, um, towards Jewish people, towards that culture, you know? Albert Cohen was my, one of my favorite uh, French writers, and, and Belle du Seigneur is a grand book that, that uh, is, uh, takes place in World War II. So I think that there's a lot of um, happiness about this. And I think that anyone who, who is starting a research like that, um, that in a quest like that, is in for a lot of surprises and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, adventure. For instance, I always wondered if my father um, had done some resistance because one day I went to Paris where my grandmother lived in Montmartre. She died in 42, right after, in December, after the round, the roundups. Do you remember Le Rafle du Veldive in, in uh, the Velodrome in, to, in uh, July of, 2000, of, um, of uh, 1942? So one of the enigmas I have yet to, to find is exactly how did my grandmother die? Did she go to Drancy? She, I know she died in a hospital, but did she go to Drancy in those transit camps where sometimes they liberated um, elderly people so I have a research to do. But when I was looking for my grandmother's apartment, I met um, a couple in the building where she was living. And by a whole streak of coincidences, they put me, um, we discovered that we both love a painter that my father collected who was Alberto Spadolini. And Spadolini turns out was a spy, was the lover of Josephine Baker for five years, and they did resistance together by doing secret messages behind their sheet music. They he was a dancer as well, and he did shows with her. Why would my father buy five paintings after the war of him? What was the link between my father and this dancer, painter, spy? So that's, um, I'm writing a book, I'm currently writing a book with uh, his nephew, um, and we're trying to do more research on Spadolini's activities during the war. So You're that's quite an uh, active woman, aren't you? Huh? <laughs> there's, there's a question in the chat window, which is about your mother-in-law. Yes. That is, what was her reaction to find out that her son had married a Jewish woman? Uh, that's a lovely question. Well, my mother-in-law, Ruth Goodman, is the best mother-in-law that one could dream of. <laughs> And for her, she didn't, I don't think she, she, she was upset that, that uh, Michael was marrying a Catholic woman. But of course, my sisters-in-law, my whole family, when they discovered that I was partly Jewer, Jewish, pardon me, they, they, they embarked in the adventure with me. And I think they were happy finally, <laughs> I guess, deep down. And one day I was doing research and, and my husband was one in the morning and, he, and his family was not in the Holocaust. Um, and, he, and my husband said, I think you're more Jewish than I am. <laughs> There's more history there. <laughs> but it, it's, it just feels wonderful to have the support of the whole family. That, that is priceless, of course. So, so there are some questions about Jacqueline. Sure. One is uh, the whole thing about going to Brazil. So I think you need to explain exactly who went to Brazil and then where did they end up because there's a little confusion. Yes. And then there's a question of whether Jacqueline had children. Okay, so um, first they went to Brazil. I, um, a researcher went to do research for me in Brazil and he discovered that they left in this, so they arrived in, in June of 40, in Lisbon, and six months later, Jacqueline and Besita leave for Brazil. They go to Rio de Janeiro. 
And we found out in the archives of Brazil that my father was denied entry in Brazil. We see that he tries to go join them, but he's denied. So the researcher who found that out, his theory is that they had a quota. Maybe my father paid a lot of money to, to, to be able to send them on a boat. Maybe it was a very costly uh, price. But we see that he wasn't able to leave until the following June. That means it took a lot of time before they were reunited, which is absolutely horrific. It took about a year and a half before they, they got reunited. So that's what I know for now. And I know that there are quite a bit of people in Brazil. That's something that I'd like to research. Um, and the other question about... Um, Did she have children? Jackson? Yes. We, we tried to find out with the private detective, but under the American laws, you can, uh, private, on, on uh, private life, you can discover the name and the identity of the parents, but not of, of the children. My theory is that there's no children because um, from what I read from the medical report on her death, um, there were no, no family, you know, it was quite dramatic. So I don't think so. Now, this question perhaps is for Robert, and it's about the Susan Mendes family. Yes. The question is about Susan Mendes's 15 children, 14 with his first wife and one with his second wife. So uh, where did they go? Those family members, where are they in the world, Robert? Well, there was a, there was a time when Susan Mendes was essentially removed from the Foreign Service, and the children were essentially blacklisted in Portugal. And many of them left to different countries. I think three or four of them came to the United States. Um, some stayed in Portugal and were in the army and went to Africa. And of course, Louis Philippe went to, um, went to Canada. And so um, some of them came back and some of them stayed and suffered. And that was the story of the family. They were just, again, they, they had, as John Paul Branches, who was the youngest son um, of Sosa Mendes, uh, relayed to me once is that he just had no future. He was denied entrance in any of the universities. And he only saw that he, and again, and two brothers and a sister, maybe three brothers and a sister came to, to North America. And so that's where they found, they all became American citizens and found their future. So I wanted to mention that if there are people on the Zoom call who would like to know more about Susan Mendez, there is a wonderful movie. It's called Disobedience, The Susan Mendez Story. And uh, we'll be sending around uh, an email later this afternoon after today's call. There'll be a link in that email for you to go and see the movie, which I really encourage everyone to do. There will also be a link to sign up for next week's program, which as I said, I think will be something very, very special indeed. So we're getting to the end of the hour and I wanted to ask both of our speakers if they had some final thoughts, uh, I guess starting with Robert and then finishing with Andre. Um, I have been involved in the Susan Mendes story for going on 35 years. It's been something that I fell into, was really serendipitous, and it's allowed me um, a tremendous growth and enrichment and understanding that a man who had everything to lose and nothing to gain um, to rescue Jews. I'm reminded when I worked, I worked in the Jewish community for a number of years. And when I would talk about it, I realized that if I had not by a, you know, fate of history, my parents and grandparents could have been at his consulate asking for a, a visa. And if he had denied it, I would not be here. So I find myself as a Jew obligated, driven to ensure that the Susan Mendes family finally get, as they did this past week, get the recognition for which he stood by and, and, and died with that sense of, of what he did as, a, as one who was an altruistic person. And so again, it's working with people like Andre and Olivia, who is a granddaughter, daughter and granddaughter recipients, and others who are on the board, and those who we have as friends throughout the world now. And I, you know, I will continue to do this. And you know, this organization is a, primarily a volunteer organization. And we have provided numbers of, 
assistance to individuals throughout the world and identify them and match them with their family members as well as others who have gone through the same experience. The program we have next week is again, um, it's a fundraiser for us. It's $36 is double high. So for those of you who don't know what high is and Jewish numerology, that's twice life, twice 18. The money that we will, part of the money that we will raise will go to highest, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society that started to help Jews. And now the, the mantra is once we were an organization to help Jews, now we're an organization as Jews to help others. I'm paraphrasing it, but given what's happened in the world, we need to be relevant in standing up on behalf of immigrants and those who are now at risk. So I invite you to join us next week. And again, thank you for your uh, participation this week um, for everything. And thank you, Andre, and thank you, Olivia, and thank you, everybody else. Andre? Well, I can only echo the very moving words of Robert. I think you've summarized it so well. Um, I share with you this, uh, this need to pursue uh, the research and the link to Susan Mendes has brought so much to my life. Um, in view of all the events that we are witnessing today, it is more important than ever to give a hand and to try to help those in need. I teach at University uh, of Montreal and I teach to immigrants who have, like my father, been obliged to, in a split second, decide to leave everything behind, parents, loved ones, possessions, a lifetime of effort. And I see that how eager they are to be welcomed and to work in their welcoming countries. And I see that, that I, I feel it's, um, it's a passion for me to see these people. And every time through their eyes, I see what my father lived when he arrived in Portugal. So I cannot express all the gratitude I have to uh, Portugal, to the people of Portugal who were simple people who opened their homes to the refugees who flooded their, their towns um, and to Sousa Mendes who risked his life uh, and who, who sacrificed his life and the life of his children uh, to help people like my father. So I think that when we have heroes, uh, people like that are, are, should be recognized and celebrated every day and give us optimism in this world where sometimes it's difficult to stay optimistic. And I want to thank Olivia, because Olivia is a driving force who really helped so many reconcile with their past. She's absolutely dedicated and welcomed me in the foundation, you know, with her open arms. So um, tribute to you, Olivia, and Joyeuse fête des pères and happy Father's Day to all of you uh, wonderful fathers who took some time to listen to us today. And of course, this was a love letter from you, the daughter, to the father that you miss so much. And I miss my father. He's living, but we're physically separated. We're unable to see each other. And so this is as much to cheer me up for my own isolation as it is to help cheer others. So thank you all for giving us some of your Father's Day and I wish you a beautiful rest of your day and hope to see you next week. Thanks and bye-bye everybody.